Rick and Andrea Huber with VonHuber.com. And you're watching Eye on Business. Welcome back to Eye on Business. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with us tonight is Eric Huber and Andrea Huber. And believe it or not, these people actually love each other and work together. That is a <laughs> frightening thought. I don't know how that works, but you'll have to tell me more. They actually work for uh, themselves, and they are involved in a group called Von Huber Inventions, and it is vonhuber.com. So, welcome, folks. Thank you for coming in today. So, Thank you for having us. So, first of all, I have to ask, how long have you been married? We're on 25 years. Oh, good. I was going to say 24. We've been okay. together way longer okay. than that. But and you chose to work years. how long into your marriage together? From the start. Right, from, from, the, the, right from the beginning. Yep. That is possible. Yep. It's amazing. Yep. So, all right, let's talk about what you do. Uh, Eric, you're quite the inventor. I understand you have a, a dozen or more actually licensed or uh, operational inventions right now and many more. And then you do support and marketing. So tell me a little bit about, just so folks know how that works. Um, what does Von Huber do? So we, we're a product development company, um, but we just basically focus on our own inventions. We have a few inventor friends that will help us or that we will help do things, but primarily we come up with ideas and try to get them licensed and come up with the next one, and that's, that's what we do. It's a lot of fun. A lot of so fun. what does that look like from the perspective of, you know, you, you just randomly are sitting on your couch and get an idea, and all of a sudden you go out to the garage and build something? I mean, is that effectively how it works? Yes. Yeah. Basically, that, that is it. <laughs> I, um, you know, we'll see something like many people. You'll see some, some problem that you have or somebody else has, mm -hmm. and you think of, oh, well, there's a way I can come up with a solution to that problem. The key is you need to find out if that problem is big enough. And that's always the fun part is because we will have a problem or I might have a problem. And I think, wow, this is a great solution to my problem. But then I soon find out I'm the only one with that problem. Right. And that, that gets a little problemsome sometimes for my own psyche because it's like, Am I that weird? Am I the only one with that problem? But the creating of the ideas... I'm sure I mean, we can find you a support group. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. If not, I'll start my own. Yeah. Um, but the, for me, it's coming up with the ideas. It's the, the, it's the it's looking for something that, is, uh, that needs the, a need in the marketplace and trying to, trying to fill that need. So. And then do you look for the opportunity? I mean, understanding that you're the marketing arm of this, and so effectively you have to get above the noise and find the real opportunity out there. So do you, how do you decide, one, how do you tell him, no, that idea's not going to work, honey. I mean, I could just see it, but, um, you know, yes. and then what do you do once you decide, okay, I have to get this product above the noise? How does that work? Well, then we, what we need to do is find a manufacturer who has um, coordinating lines that that particular product will fit into. Okay. Um, not a manufacturer who is not interested in expanding into a new line. Sometimes they are. Mm -hmm. um, they will ask for, say, something, and they might be looking in the bath um, lines. Mm -hmm. they, they do want to expand. Um, and I do talk to them. I talk to the CEOs. They tell me what they're looking for, and that I'm... Great idea, but not interested. Or, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. Right. Yeah, and it's really neat right now. We've been inventing a long time. In the olden days, say 10, 12, 15 years ago, um, it was very closed. Uh, manufacturers were very closed. They had their own R&D departments. Mm -hmm. No thanks, we'll do it. We do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. But again, about 10, probably 10 years ago, they started to really open up, and this whole open innovation started happening. And now you can find almost every company out there has even a portal on their website for inventors to submit their products. So, and it's so very that brings different. me to a question that I don't want to go down the politics too much, but it's kind of important because mm -hmm. the patent rights have changed substantially, yes. and, and we moved for, from what was called first to invent in the past 
to first to file. And what that means is effectively, it doesn't matter if you're the first to actually invent something anymore. If they've got better lawyers and faster limos to the patent office, they win. So how do you avoid um, giving away an idea and having someone else just go through the back door and patent that idea? Yeah, the whole patent thing, we've been to Washington DC quite a few times speaking to, um, to Congress about the whole issue and how the change in the patent system has really eroded the rights to the independent inventor. Yeah. And it's made it very difficult, um, very difficult to, to enforce. And so you, 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 there's a, it's a much different environment out there, and it, and it is very difficult. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember that um, it's 97% of all patents have not been commercialized. And 80 to 90% of the products on the, in the market right now don't have patents. So uh, patents are very important. And depending on your technology, we tend to do more um, consumer products. Okay. And they have a, so maybe... The patents a, are less important? They're, they're less important in that it's a, it's a shorter product cycle. Right. It's very expensive to patent something. It takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And are you going to be able to defend it? Patents right. are one of the most costly litigations out there. So it's gotten to the point where it's, it's like, you know, get to f be first to the market, do it right at a good price point, have a good trademark maybe, a good logo, mm -hmm. and, and really, really go after it. So, so, so it really is most important to be first above the noise, not so, so much as the person with the protection to stop once it gets above it. Um, that's pretty much yeah. what most of the manufacturers are believing, first to market. Yeah, and it's, it used to be, oh, you can't license something without intellectual property, without a, a patent or so, um, because you don't own anything. There, right. are, there is nothing there. There's no property there. But that's not true. That's not true. Um, we've actually, we've licensed 21 products, and of those, three of them had IP, and actually one of them ended up uh, issuing. Now, 21 sounds like a lot, like I tell my inventor friends, the licensing agreement is is the beginning of the journey, not mm -hmm. the end. It's the beginning, mm -hmm. because it, once a manufacturer has licensed your product, you, it's very important to have a strong licensing agreement to protect yourself. But there is, like you say, there's a lot of noise, and they're they're busy doing other things. They have other focuses and such, or the market changes, or the economy. So how do changes. I get from I have this great idea as an individual, and I have no clue what to do? So I call you. Do I call you first? Do I, I mean, mm -hmm. do you look at the market opportunity before he wastes his time looking at the product, or do you look at the product before she wastes her time doing the? We I mean, discuss it. You know, so you do work together on the front end. Yeah, and okay. you know, we we really are so busy with our own stuff mm -hmm. that we don't do a lot outside. Okay. I mean, we have a we've been involved in this long enough that we have a lot of inventor friends. So I constantly have people contacting coaching us. Coaching them yeah. and things, but that's yeah. more of a friendly thing, right? Yeah, but if it's a product that they um, that fits into our categories, then we often bring them in. Because I found that um, inventing, inventing in categories, which is what I tend to do, mm -hmm. gives you more credibility when you're talking to this manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking to a manufacturer and you say, hey, here's my, here's my widget. Oh, great, nice widget. But instead, if you come in and say, hey, here are 12 different widgets, and it's, it, I have a brand of, of, you know, widgets are us, and I have this, all this stuff. And they all solve together. similar problems in some sort of genre or category right. that fits, right? right? Um, from the marketing perspective, do, are you worried about marketing to the end user, or are you focused only on getting the attention of licensing manufacturers? What's your general focus? Not to the end user. Okay, it, so you're it's totally to focused on the manufacturer, the manufacturer okay. but also um, coming up with the uh, the marketing background. You have to have uh, video. You have to have sell sheets. You have to have um, a, a whole package that you're going to be presenting to the manufacturer. Otherwise, it's it's just an Another idea. Another product, right? Yeah, and, and right. that's what sells it is having. All of those. Um, now, do they take that and run with together. what you what you do, or is that just enough to get their attention? I mean, how does that generally work? Well, the first thing is to get their attention, but we have found that in many cases they will actually do test marketing um, with your images, with your prototypes, with that you know that See type of thing. People respond to yeah. it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's interesting. Uh, we've done. I've had twelve products tested on as seen on TV. I've had three commercials made. What people might not realize is that there really is just one product. 
there, you know, you see this on TV, there, that's a prototype. That's right. a one-off, one-of-a-kind prototype. And if you notice, often it'll say, you know, available in four to six weeks. Right. Well, four to six weeks in, nowadays is unheard of when, yeah. you know, Amazon's delivering by drones tomorrow. Yeah. So what My they books do... books print overnight. And yeah. They ship, like, the next day. Crazy. It's, you know. So they, they uh, see what the results of that commercial will be, mm-hmm. and then they'll decide whether they're going to go and start manufacturing. So what happens if you get 10,000 orders that doesn't, it's still not enough? Do they send a cancellation notice to the mm-hmm. client? Really? Yeah. Yeah, they send them, they'll send them coupons and such, but they don't right. run their card, you know, right, so they're right. not yeah. doing We're anything. sorry, but we've ended the manufacturing yeah. of that particular product. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. So now, I also understand from what I've been told, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the shipping and handling usually covers the retail or the, the wholesale cost yeah. of the product. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's what I understand. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask it on TV. Yeah. Only, well, 10% of the product sales are from that commercial. Right. The other 90% are from the store shelves. Yep. And for instance, in some, like I think it's CVS or such, they, um, the as seen on TV end cap mm-hmm. is the second most profitable real estate in the store next to cold medicine. How funny. So it's yeah, a very valuable. Whole, they have whole stores in the mall oh, yeah. for as seen on TV. Absolutely. And it's funny because I know better than to buy anything on as seen on TV. I always wait for it to hit the mall if I really feel like I want to buy it. I think the average sell on, on TV, you know, it's 19.95. You know, act now and you'll right. get a second for right. The average sale, I think, is like $70 because of the up, you know, the shipping right. and handling. The second product is free, but there's additional handling. And so. So are you using 3D printing? Or are you doing any of the things that allow you to mock up faster? Because I know that um, in the jewelry industry, I was a master goldsmith and I could quite literally take any photograph of a 3D item and in hundreds of hours hand carve, I don't care if it was a little dragon with fingernails and eyelashes and the whole thing, this big. Well, now they can just take a picture of that and the liquid disappears and laser runs across it and mm-hmm. boom, you're done. I mean, it's printed. It's crazy. Um, so I can see where that could be incredibly helpful to the inventor, but it also kind of makes it sort of less original and less valuable, mm-hmm. doesn't it? I mean, how Absolutely. do you fight that? Absolutely. It's it's changed a lot. I, in, I, I was written up in Inventor's Digest as, the, the, um, Mag- as a MacGyver mm-hmm. and because I could almost – Prototype almost anything out of foam core, duct tape, paper mache, and glue. Love it. I'm old school. I yeah. love to work with my hands, mold it as, as a jeweler. You'll probably understand yeah, this, but totally. I love to do that. Nowadays, though, the, the game has stepped up. And with 3D printing, it's amazing how you can make anything. I, I had, I was actually going to bring it, a friend of mine scanned my head with a 3D <laughs> scanner and printed it. And so I have a little, you know, little statue of myself and, and did it in, in minutes. It, yeah. It's incredible. See, and if you did that in lost wax, I mean, I can tell you that, that as a caster, I can actually take any wax and, and the, any design in wax and the right wax and burn it out and cast it in any metal I want. And I mm-hmm. mean, so, oh, yeah. But again, I'm not having to carve it anymore. I just right. use a three-dimensional image of something. And, and in fact, you can even use the animation engines and stretch it and pull mm-hmm. it and change it. Absolutely. Not have to do, I mean, it's crazy. So, yeah. so one of the reasons why I feel like, wow, I spent 16,000 hours training as a jeweler to have some yeah, machine that can, can push, push a push button and burn the thing now, you know. But yeah. it's coming down in the future. Yeah, um, that's true. For those that are not experienced in trying to market to the manufacturers, I mean, if someone really does get an idea, where do they start? I mean, do you just, I mean, I can't imagine just hitting their website and randomly start no. throwing information at them. Where do they generally, where would they start? Uh, well, f- first of all, you have to find out if your product is already on the market mm-hmm. or if it's if it has been tried to be marketed. Right. And if it has failed, just leave it alone. And how do you do that? Yeah. Is that a phone call? Is there a place where you can go that productsuck.com? I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <and laughs> I mean, you're talking about with 3D printers and such, you know, the advent of the Internet. I mean, you can find almost anything. Yeah. And so that's always the, our first step is we come up with an idea, and the first thing is to do due diligence. Yes. What my goal is is to find a reason not to go forward with right. my, with my idea. You have to become really good at searching. On really good at searching. My it. poor daughter, Caitlin, who is really bright, and she's constantly coming up with ideas and, and she'll write to me and I'll go and do the, mm-hmm. yeah. the trademark yeah. search or then I'll send her a picture. She's like, damn, yeah. man, it's like, I lost another one. But, and I keep telling her, just keep trying because you never know. Right, sure. Um, and some product might just blow up. 
Um, what's the story with the, the fidget spinners? From what I understand is that person missed the opportunity to patent that product and therefore is not making any money on it. Is yeah. that true? Do you know about Yeah, what happened was um, actually she did patent it. And um, it, the patent, um, the, uh, the, what is the, the term? When, um, the maintenance fee was due. Okay. The maintenance fee was due, and it was like 750 bucks, and nothing was happening with it. So she just let, let, it, let it lapse, basically. Uh, that's so and, painful. Yeah, and then now uh, the rest of the story. I had a family member who had some property in Lebanon that didn't pay the property taxes on it, so that when the government oh. converted back, that property was worth more money than I can even say, Jeez. but but he hadn't paid the annual taxes, so oh. the Lebanese government went, well, you didn't pay your taxes, yeah. so we're going to take it from you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so sometimes it pays to pay your maintenance. Yeah, fees. yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, you you know, it's it's very difficult now, again, we're talking about patents, knockoffs. I mean, it, it happens so quickly and so blatantly in many cases. And we, I have a friend um, in the inventing world who came up with this invention uh, with the, the balloons, mm -hmm. where you can fill a hundred balloons up at yeah. once. Yep. So he, I actually use that product. Do yeah. you? Yep. It's great. It's, Josh. it's expensive, but I use it because it's time saver. Yeah, know? Josh Malone. Yeah. And uh, one of the as seen on TV companies wanted wanted the product, and he said, "No, that's not the route I want to go." Eh, they just did it on their own. Yeah. He has spent I, in excess of a million dollars fighting it. Yeah. It has gone up it, all the way up. It's probably going to be even going to the Supreme Court. It's crazy yeah, what's going on. Yeah. So it's it, it's very difficult to defend things nowadays. So on that on that note, one last point I, I'd like to cover is the patent trolls because some people are bothered, and I hear this all the time. Oh, the patent trolls! They buy up patents and then they go sue people. Well, as a low end person or someone that doesn't have a lot of money. My only opportunity may be selling to a patent mm -hmm. troll. Absolutely. So if that patent troll wants to take a right that I created and pay me money and then go chase it down, more power to them. I mean, Absolutely. I don't see why this is a problem. I really don't. Yeah. The, the incredible marketing. I think it was by Google to come up with that, that term troll. Yeah. And actually, it wasn't Google. But anyway, that was part of the whole thing. It, it has completely made this this whole thing just completely out of proportion. Yeah. It's, it's a totally very legit small, concept. Yeah, it's a yeah. very small problem in yeah. terms of people. They use the example of somebody who had some technology, I think, in Wi-Fi router. So they were going to uh, the coffee shops that had that router mm -hmm. and suing them. Mm -hmm. it, 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 that doesn't happen very right. often. It's very rare. More important is, is what you said, is the inventor, as I said before, it's very expensive litigation. Sure. And that is the only route many people can go. I don't have to money say, to sue Google yeah, or Apple absolutely. or whoever. So as far as I'm concerned, if I can sell it to some investor who wants to pay right. me a million bucks and take their money and go off and sue them, good for them. That's, yeah, you know, I think it's especially great. Especially a million. Yeah, yeah, I mean, seriously, <laughs> I'm all for it. You know, anybody who's opposed to patent trolls, I'm all for them. I think yeah. they're awesome. They're non-practicing entities, it, not And trolls. I agree, and that's why I think it wanted to bring it up, because I hear this all the time, and I'm like, yeah. that's absurd. Yeah. If, if I don't have the money to take it to market, and I want to sell it to somebody, and they decide to exercise defense of that patent, mm -hmm. right? I don't know why this is a problem. Well, well with that said, hey, I, as always, I haven't seen you in a couple of years on the show, and I'm really glad you came back, Thank and you. I hope you'll come back again sometime in the future, and I wish you luck. Thank it's you good to very meet you much. and have you good on. Thanks for having us. Thank again. you. Take care. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you've been watching Ion Business. And with us tonight has been Eric and Andrea Huber with vonhuber.com. We hope you'll come back. Welcome to Ion Business Innovation, where we look at innovative companies, innovative people, and their innovative products. Today, however, we have a very special guest, Kurt Key, who is doing research on entrepreneurs. Uh, to quote or to paraphrase, uh, Noam Wasserman's uh, studies of uh, entrepreneurs, he says, we do a lot to, s to celebrate entrepreneurs. We don't do very much to study them. So Kirk's going to help us with that today. So Kirk, welcome to the show. Thank you, Shen. So tell us about your research. Just kind of broadly, how did you get into this and sure. what does it consist of? Okay, there's a long and a short version of the answer. Um, the long answer is I got turned on to this uh, idea called the diffusion of innovations when I was doing my master's thesis uh, research. Okay. And then after that, I continued to study this, and that took me to study um, the development and adoption of technologies as okay. innovations within okay. the workplace. And then fast forward to more recently, um, I've been uh, um, uh, interested in studying how um, dispersed groups of experts come together and innovate and create uh, new solutions to solve problems okay. Okay. and one thing led to another 
um, that uh, brought me to entrepreneurship yeah. and also the startup uh, community to understand how people gotcha. organize to develop and promote and diffuse their innovations. Okay, so diffuse is an interesting term. It's used mm -hmm. a number of ways, but you have a particular usage of that when you talk about diffusion of innovation. Maybe explain that to our sure, audience. Sure, definitely. So uh, I will use the word diffuse to refer to really a series of uh, activities, uh, okay. starting from the development of an idea uh, to the adoption and implementation and to, to the ultimate promotion and diffusion, the spread, the okay. spreading of the spreading innovation of within okay. a okay. marketplace or within the social system. So if I understand correctly, you see several stages in mm -hmm. that diffusion process. Can you Absolutely. maybe uh, delineate that for sure, us? Sure, definitely. Um, so traditionally, uh, we look at the series of stages in a linear fashion. So a uh, new product or a new piece of technology has to go through the development uh, process first. Okay. And it gets okay. tested and finally uh, commercialized and gets okay. uh, adopted and implemented okay. by users. But in today's Web 2.0, environment and new technologies available on the web, many of these innovations keep um, getting updated constantly. So okay. the development and the implementation and the diffusion process usually happen almost concurrently. Okay. Now, but you talk about, if mm -hmm. I understand, you've got uh, terminology I remember like early adopters and yes. later adopters. So can you maybe outline those different subgroups for sure, us? Sure, sure, sure. So in general, there are five different groups of adopters uh, in the marketplace. Okay. The first group I refer to as the diehard fans, and they're usually are about 2.5% of the population. Okay. These people are technologically very sophisticated, they're venturesome, okay. and they like to try out new ideas. So you don't have to convince them too much, and they will very quickly pick up your new innovation. So and these are your hardcore geeks mm -hmm. and nerds? Is that another way Absolutely. to look at it? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, right. that's a good way to, <laughs> to right. put it. Okay. And so after the first 2.5% come uh, the uh, early adopters. Okay. Uh, these are very um, savvy uh, people. They're very smart and they like to carefully evaluate an innovation before they adopt. Okay. And because okay. They, okay. Uh, they're careful with the evaluation, um, they, oh, they enjoy the respect of their peers. Okay. So they're okay. very influential uh, to, uh, in terms of pr promoting your innovation okay. once they are on board. Once they're on board. And then what comes after the early adopters? Uh, next is uh, about um, um, the 30, uh, about 34 percent of the population we refer to as early majority. Early so majority, these okay. people are very pragmatic. Okay. Um, they are a little bit slower in terms of, of making the decision to adopt, but okay. they usually adopt after they realize that this innovation is going to stick around, and so they jump on board right before the average user. Okay. Now, uh, this may not be an answerable question, mm -hmm. but how, how can the average entrepreneur make use of this kind of information? Oh, that's a great question. So, uh, for example, if an entrepreneur uh, uh, in Orange County trying okay. to um, promote innovation, and we know that in Orange County we have approximately um, um, 3 million um, uh, residents. Okay. Um, so, the first 2.5% uh, of the population uh, equals roughly 75,000 people. Okay. So if you have an app for your innovation or you have a website to track users, um, so you can um, use the geolocation to okay. estimate the first um, 75,000 users okay. are your diehard fans. Okay. So okay. you want to provide some incentive uh, for them um, to, gotcha. to get okay. on board and also to promote. Okay. But once you pass that 75,000, uh, when you move to the next 13 for your 5% of the early adopters, um, that equals roughly 405,000 residents okay. of Orange County. Uh, these are the people who bridge the, the, the nerds okay. and the regular population. Okay. So okay. you want to give them the double, triple, or quadruple incentives to okay. use your okay. innovation and to promote your innovation. So that uh, would be a strategy. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's all about in different incentives for different stages to encourage Absolutely. the continuation of the diffusion process. Absolutely, gotcha. because okay. if you give too much incentive to the first group, the rest of the population will say, oh, that's for the nerds, that's for <laughs> okay. the geeks, and that's not for me. Okay. So you want to uh, capitalize on the, okay. um, the relatedness uh, of the second group okay. to help uh, push your innovation. Okay. Now, I also understand you're doing a second body of research on some of the characteristics of, of successful startups. Yes. Uh, let's talk about that. So what are, what are some of the, s the characteristics that people might recognize? Yes, yes. Uh, so one of the uh, first uh, characteristic 
projects uh, is uh, having a common goal, share goal. Okay. So uh, a question that a startup group can ask themselves is, is everyone on the team moving in the same direction? Okay. Okay. Uh, the okay. second uh, characteristic is having multidisciplinary expertise. Okay. As we know that today's innovations yep. require a range of expertise and yep. knowledge. So uh, a, a startup group can ask themselves the question, do we have the appropriate range of expertise to help us develop the product okay. and to market it. Um, next is to have the uh, strategic structure. Okay. So okay. some groups are more hierarchical and some groups are more flat in the okay. hierarchy. So pick the one that is appropriate for your particular uh, okay. culture okay. and also uh, group and then ask yourself if you have the right structure to enable okay. the group okay. to function. So let me go back to that second one. It's mm -hmm. what I would what the terminology I'm used to is complementary skills that Absolutely. you have. You want to have somebody that's uh, maybe a coder, a financial person, a marketing person, but mm -hmm. you don't want three of any one of those. You want, a, you want a range of skills. And then the, the trick is, of course, is their chemistry there. Can people work together? So mm -hmm. is that yes. the same kind of thing? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, through the research that I've been doing, um, I've learned one very important lesson, which is find the people you want to partner with first okay. and then decide what you want to partner on. Okay. Um, okay. Some of the mistakes that we've seen is that people uh, came up with a good idea and they believe that, oh, I need to now find a partner to help me make this happen. So they're looking for expertise instead of a relationship, uh, the, the bonding and the ability to be complementary, okay. uh, which is really the magic sauce of a successful team. So that's what I'm familiar with, is that uh, it's, it's really about the team, number one. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is those people have to be able to work uh, under pressure, yes. uh, under time pressure at the very least, and often under financial pressure, and pressure of a lot of criticism, frankly. Um, and so are there any other tips we can give them for how to go about bringing the team together and then keeping it together? Uh, definitely. I would say that hire for personality and character okay. um, because okay. when you're in a startup situation, everyone is dealing with uh, uh, a new task for the first time. So yep. okay. Uh, okay. the team can, can, can learn and train new members, but you can't change someone's personality. <laughs> so hire for fit, uh, that's very important, and then fire quickly. If you realize that someone is not a good fit, don't keep them around for too long because they can um, hurt the culture okay. and the team spirit. Okay. Now, you've obviously uh, been doing this research for a while. Are there any other tips you would want to give uh, you know, new entrepreneurs in particular uh, that they should be looking out for? Um, I would say um, in terms of uh, marketing the innovation, Okay. Um, there are several ideas to, to keep in mind. Uh, one is uh, to tap into a special group of uh, people in the population okay. that we refer to as opinion leaders. Okay. Um, okay. These are the people who informally influence the opinions of their peers, near okay. peers. Okay. And also sometimes they're referred to as market mavens. Okay. Uh, these are the people okay. who go out there and yep. they learn a lot about information about what is available in the market and they go tell a lot of people about it. Gotcha. And okay. these people are also sometimes referred to as influencers. I was going to say, that's yeah. the terminology I've heard actually yes. from one one of the teams are familiar with is mm -hmm. micro influencers and mm -hmm. yes. influencers in general. So it's yes. a, it's a coming trend, I guess. Yes. So they are about five to eight percent of the population. Okay. Um, so one way is to 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 look to go out there and look for these people. Um, and one of the characters, defining characteristics is that they have a lot of weak ties. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, so at first uh, glance, we may think that weak ties are not very, very powerful. Okay. In fact, what we have found is that to spread a new idea or to tell people about a new innovation is actually uh, very powerful to work through weak ties because they okay. are able to broadcast okay. information very quickly, very efficiently to a lot of people gotcha. um, okay. in a short period of time. Okay. So, so I do want to give you a, another chance here to say a little bit about your research group and how that's yes. structured and who's on it and so forth and yes. tell people how to get in touch with you. Too. Yes, yes. So I'm running right now a research group at Chapman University. It's called the OCT Group. Our website is octgroup.org. Okay. So right now, um, we are primarily funded by the National Science Foundation. Okay. Uh, we have two uh, active grants right now, um, slightly over $850,000 uh, from okay. the federal government. Okay. So we do academic research that is also very applied in nature okay. because we want okay. to give our information um, to the community and help people succeed okay. in, in their ventures. Um, so right now, um, I am the principal investigator of the okay. group, and I have a postdoc, Andrew Schrock, uh, okay. that I just recruited from the Edinburgh uh, Innovation Lab uh, okay. from, the, uh, from USC. Okay. Um, so he's working on the project. 
um, and also I have um, Lita Benjamin and Jamie McCain, two okay. undergraduate students at Chapman University. Um, they are actually spearheading um, a project right now, interviewing people at the launch labs that okay. you direct. Okay. So, um, so we're uh, right now a team of uh, four, and okay. then we just recruited a new member, uh, Jacob Lopez, uh, who just started. Um, okay. Right now, this summer, with us, and um, so we have uh, five people uh, okay, running the, the team. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just nice to hear that there's that much research going on on entrepreneurship. Because again, you know, back to Wasserman's quote, we do a lot to celebrate entrepreneurs. We hear a lot of individual case studies and stories, but it's nice that somebody's doing some of the systematic research as well. Well, Kirk, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show. Thank really you. Really appreciate having it, me. and I'm sure our view viewers will get a lot out of this as well. You have been watching Eye on Business Innovation.